Lydia Halley, and today I'm going to give you a pretty well, like high-level walkthrough of basically everything that happens going from our human-friendly JavaScript file all the way down to something that computers can understand. And there are, like, there are so many parts to this process, but for now I'm only going to focus on two things, namely the browser side of things and V8 side of things. And V8 is the JavaScript engine used in Chromium-based browsers and in Node as well. First, let's go all the way back to the beginning. So we're trying to load a website that uses a small calc.js script. And as we're trying to load the website, the HTML parser encounters a script tag and tries to fetch the calc.js file from either the network or maybe cache or a service worker that prefetched a file. Either way, a stream of bytes get returned that gets sent to the byte stream decoder, or Elixir. And this is part of the parser that takes care of decoding the stream of bytes and generating tokens based on the data it received. For example, it sees that the bytes decode to uh, F-U-N-C-T-I-O-N. <laughs> it generates a token saying like, hey, I know this function is a keyword in JavaScript and it creates a token based on that and it'll just continue to do so for the rest of the stream as well. And as it's generating these tokens, it's actually sending them all down to the parser. And the parser then goes ahead and creates notes based on the tokens that match a certain syntax rule in JavaScript. Um, for example, a variable declaration or a function statement. And based on these notes, a parser generates an abstract syntax tree that represents our program. Now, this one is uh, very much simplified because in real life, it also contains some extra information about a program, but for now, this will suffice. Um, and also while it's doing that, it's checking for syntax errors because the tokens themselves may be valid, but maybe they may not actually match a certain syntax rule. Finally, it's time for the JavaScript engine to do its work because this AST is actually sent down to V8's ignition interpreter. And this interpreter is responsible for generating the bytecode that it based on the AST that it received. Um, and we can actually see the bytecode that gets generated with the uh, print bytecode flag in Node. So for example, this bytecode for our calc function, um, if we invoke it with an object containing an X, Y, and Z key, it would look something like this. And uh, this may seem like a lot of data, but there's actually only two parts here that are really important. So ignition uses registers in order to execute the bytecode. And there's registers like R0 and R1, but there's also an accumulated register that the bytecodes use for their input and output, or both. Uh, and then there's also registers like A0 that are used for the values that got passed to the function. And this makes more sense as we're walking through the bytecode, don't worry. Um, so in this case, we passed an object containing an X, Y, and Z key to the function. So this is where the second part of the generated output is important because A0 points to a shape table that contains information on where to find those properties on the object that we pass to the function. All right, so now let's see what those bytecodes actually do. So in the very first line, we see LDA named property bytecode. So LDA specifies that a value gets loaded into the accumulator and that the value is the named property from the object that we pass to the function stored in A0. And the property itself can be found on index zero. So we see that the value on index zero maps to X. So we load the value of the X property of the object that we pass to the function. So the numeric value 10 in this case. <laughs> then we multiply the current value in the accumulator by the small integer 50. And then star r0 specifies that the current value of the accumulator has to get stored in register r0. Then again, we load a property and store this into the accumulator, but this time it's from the second index, which points to y. And y has a value of 20, so the value of the accumulator is now 20. And star 2 specifies again that the current value of the accumulator uh, has to get stored in register r2. We again load a named property from a1, or sorry, a0 into the accumulator, um, the value on a third index this time, which maps to z as a value of 30. So we multiply the current value of the accumulator with the value that's currently stored in register R2. So one more step, we have to add the value stored at register R0 to the current value of the accumulator. So this means that we're adding 500 plus 600 is 1100. And finally, we return the value of the accumulator, which is 1100. Now the bytecode that is generated by the bytecode generator also goes th through some smaller optimizations after which the bytecode actually gets executed and it's possible to run this on our machines. So finally, we have something that our machines can work with. Now you may have noticed that I skipped some things in the bytecode. Um, so let's see what's up with them. This is actually part of V8's optimizations. 
because when we pass an object to V8, such as the X, Y, and Z object in this case, it creates a shape for that specific object structure. Um, and if you're reading like documentation or blog posts, this is also referred to as a hidden class or a map, but it's kind of confusing because we also have classes in JavaScript and we have maps in JavaScript, but it's not a JavaScript cl class or a JavaScript map. So shape is the way to go because we don't have those natively in JavaScript. Um, so a shape is basically just a structure of that object. And this shape contains pointers to the offsets on which we can find the values of the properties on the object. Because even though we only specified the X, Y, and Z properties, there are many, many more built-in properties and objects uh, that also all have their location somewhere stored in memory. So when we're trying to access a property on the object, for example, X, um, it can now just get it quicker by checking, okay, does this object have the same shape? Yeah, it does. Okay, cool. Uh, now I, I want to get X so I know the offset. Shapes are really useful for an optimization technique that V8 uses, namely inline caching. Um, with inline caching, we basically store the results from previous operations so that the next time we call the exact same operation, we already know the result. Now, each time we do a property lookup, it can just simply store the results for the offset that the last time it did a lookup. So in the future, when we're trying to perform the exact same action, it can simply just get the result from the inline cache instead. Now, these inline caches are not only beneficial for the interpreter, but they also generate re really valuable feedback for the TurboFan optimizer. So finally, <laughs> we can go back to the bytecode example, because these values are actually references to a feedback vector slot, where it stores information about the execution of the function. And this includes information from like arithmetic operations, such as the fact that so far we've only added numbers, which result in a numeric value. One useful example of this is the fact that in JavaScript, you can also concatenate strings with the plus operator, which would have to be handled way differently internally. But so far it knows, okay, I've only had numerical values. That's fine. Now let's say that we're invoking the calc function hundreds of times. This function is now considered hot. Um, because although the bytecode is already really fast, V8 actually uses TurboFan, the TurboFan optimizer, in order to generate machine code that's even faster. So based on the bytecode and the generated feedback for specific code blocks, it can generate optimized architecture-specific machine code um, that can run directly on your machine. So the next time that we invoke the function, it can just skip over the bytecode and immediately execute the machine code instead. However, there is one problem in JavaScript, namely that it's dynamically typed. So we can invoke the calc function with the same object, like hundreds and thousands of times, but there is absolutely no guarantee that this will always be the case in the future. For example, we can also invoke the calc function with, I don't know, an, an empty object or just with an X key or just an X and Y key. I don't know why you would do it, but it's possible. So for all those different types of objects, V8 generates a new shape that contains the new different properties. So previously, we saw that the inline cache contained a field with a value of the shape of the object and then the corresponding offset. However, if we passed multiple objects, so multiple shapes got generated, we also have to update the inline cache in order for it to point to multiple shapes uh, and their offset. So now when we're trying to load a property from a specific object, it first has to walk through all the possible shapes in order for it to find the object that contains that specific property, which could result in a linear search, which is not very optimal. but. Now, previously, we generated machine code for the calc function when it's only gotten invoked with one type of object, namely the object with the X, Y, and Z keys. However, if we call the calc function again, but with a different shape, TurboFan's shape check fails, uh, in which case we can no longer use this optimized machine code, and we actually have to de-optimize back to the generated bytecode. And this is a pretty expensive operation that you uh, mostly want to avoid. So the inline cache of the calc function is also updated to say like, hey, it's actually got multiple shapes now. Um, now the calc function again can get hot and optimized even after deoptimization. Although TurboFan has to handle it a little bit differently when it's encountered multiple shapes. And these inline caches actually also have multiple states because if an inline cache has only seen one type of object, it's considered monomorphic, which is pretty much the best case scenario because in that case, we can just generate optimized machine code and assume that in the future, this function will just get invoked with the same uh, object shape. 
Now, if a cache has two or four different shapes, it's considered polymorphic. And if we're continuously just invoking it with whatever random types, uh, it's considered megamorphic, in which case it's like, you know what, never mind, I won't try to optimize it. So as you can see, although it's pretty nice for us sometimes as developers that JavaScript is dynamically typed, it's, uh, it's not so great for the compiler. And it can really only work with speculations and just assume that in the future, we will use the same type of data. Now, even though I had to walk through this pretty quickly, we went all the way down from loading the scripts in our browser all the way down to uh, running optimized machine code on your machine. And I just want to quickly mention that there are so many great resources out there um, if you want to know more about the internals of V8 and it's open source, so you can just check out the source code if you want. Anyways, thank you so much for watching and have fun coding. Oh,